Slavery has a long legacy in North America. In some ways, North American slavery was similar to slavery in other parts of the world and at other times in human history. Before Europeans arrived on the continent, Native American tribes often enslaved competing tribes, and Spanish explorers used the enforced labor of Native Americans in the early 1500s. In some instances, Native American tribes enslaved Europeans. But in other ways, North American slavery was different. As in other parts of the Western Hemisphere, slavery became closely associated with socially constructed racial differences. The first African slaves arrived in modern-day South Carolina in 1526. They successfully rebelled against their Spanish enslavers and lived with the indigenous people. In August of 1619, 20 Africans were forcibly brought to the British colony of Virginia, joining a population of white indentured servants. Some of these Africans were freed upon completing their work contract or converting to Christianity, but others were kept enslaved. In the Dutch colony of New Amsterdam, the first 11 African slaves landed in 1625. They worked as farmers, fur traders, and builders. These slaves had their families kept intact, could be married, could testify in court, could sign legal documents, and could bring legal action against whites. However, over the course of the 17th century, things got much worse. The first law formally codifying the practice of slavery in the British colonies was passed in 1641 in Massachusetts. In Virginia, indentured servitude dwindled over time, but was replaced by slavery. In 1661, Virginia passed its law allowing any free person to own slaves, and over the remainder of the century, legal distinctions between white indentured servants and African slaves grew including the institution of chattel slavery, with children inheriting their mother's slave status. Interracial marriage was banned, and enslavers were prohibited from freeing their slaves unless they were also removed from the state of Virginia. By the early 17th century, England became the world's largest slave trader. New Amsterdam was captured by the British and renamed New York in 1664. Under British rule, by 1703, more than 42% of the city's households contained slaves. By 1710, 42% of the population of Virginia was African. In Maryland, 23%. However, it was in this period, too, that the seeds that would end slavery began. The first public American document protesting slavery was written by Quakers outside Philadelphia in 1688. But their petition was ignored. During the late 1700s, Methodist and Baptist preachers traveled the South, attempting to persuade slaveholders to free their slaves, accepting slaves as members and preachers in their churches. And slaves themselves resisted, slowing down their work, breaking their tools, running away, and initiating a series of armed uprisings. When Thomas Jefferson, a slaveholder, first drafted the Declaration of Independence, he sharply contrasted the British's slavery in the colonies with the ideals of equality and liberty Americans were fighting for, seeking its abolition. However, his fellow founders, divided on the issue of slavery, voted to remove Jefferson's language. During the American Revolution, African Americans fought on both sides. Both the British and Americans offered freedom to slaves who fought for them. A substantial portion of the American army was black, including both former slaves and freeborn blacks. During the Revolutionary War in 1777, northern states began passing laws abolishing slavery and instituting emancipation, part of a growing national abolitionist movement. By 1804, every northern state had successfully adopted abolition or gradual emancipation. New York celebrated the last of their slaves to be freed with a parade on July 4, 1827. Nationally, Congress made importing slaves a federal crime on January 1, 1808, the very first day allowed by the Constitution. However, despite all the progress the revolution enabled, in the South, slavery only got worse. The invention of the cotton gin led to a massive expansion in the industry, leading to an increased demand for slave labor. Before 1812, America produced fewer than 300,000 bales of cotton, by 1850, it multiplied over 10 times. The ban on slave importation posed little obstacle 
as slaves were illegally smuggled in and a domestic slave breeding industry grew to take its place. Maryland, Virginia, and the Carolinas adopted slave exporting as a major business, breeding and sending slaves further south. By 1860, approximately 400,000 enslavers held approximately 4 million slaves, with slaves in about 8% of American households. While the overwhelming majority of slave owners were white, many free blacks held slaves as well, including 43% of South Carolina's free blacks. The treatment of slaves varied, but it was most often brutal. Slaves were whipped, shackled, hanged, beaten, burned, mutilated, and branded. Enslaved women were sometimes medically treated to enhance their fertility, made to procreate and then separated from their children to support the slave breeding business. They were also often raped by their enslavers. Today, the vast majority of black Americans' DNA shows some European ancestry due to slaves so frequently bearing their enslavers' children. Many Americans had long defended slavery as a necessary evil, but increasingly, Southerners began to defend it differently. Former Vice President and then Senator from South Carolina, John C. Calhoun, argued in 1837, let me not be understood as admitting, even by implication, that the existing relations between the two races in the slaveholding states is an evil. Far otherwise, I hold it to be a good, as it has thus far proved itself to be to both, and will continue to prove so, if not disturbed by the fell spirit of abolition. Racist pseudoscience was used to justify unequal treatment of blacks and whites. Dr. Samuel A. Cartwright argued that the proclivity of slaves to run away was a mental illness he named dreptomania, to be cured by whipping. Yet while a handful of plantations became extraordinarily wealthy off the backs of slaves, overall the cruelty of slavery did not lead the South to prosper. Although the North, too, was enmeshed in the slave-based cotton industry via banking and shipping, as Alexis de Tocqueville noted in 1835, the colonies in which there were no slaves became more populous and more rich than those in which slavery flourished. The South's income was double that of the North before the Revolution, but by 1840, after slavery was banned in the North and expanded in the South, it had dropped far behind. Accounts of slavery's cruelty as well as anger over Northern businesses' complicity with it, brought many to the abolitionist cause, growing a movement that would bring American slavery to its end following a bloody civil war. Learn more about the stories that define and unite us at fairstory.org.